Hey, today we're going to learn, and I'm going to teach y'all what the hell Atlantis is. So we're going to start this off slow. Make sure y'all got your gas, everything ready, your popcorn, because this is going to be a minute. We're going to be in this bitch about an hour, so y'all going to roll with me on this. Let's do this here. Now, we're going to combine the story of Atlantis, right, with the people of Middle Earth. And it's going to also correlate with um, Noah and the Ark. And your phone got cracked, so it's fucked up. Um, that's why you can't have people use your phone. Right. All my YouTubers, don't let people use your phone, because they might end up going viral off your own shit. All right, now, um, we know that it's in India, right? No, you guys don't, or you wouldn't be watching that video. And as you see, we got Watso videos up on the screen, so we will also get help from Watso about the story of Atlantis, the movie, because that is the connection between the movie and the people of Middle Earth, because, you know, the white hair, the whole tribal um, insignias. So let's go with where we think the actual Atlantis is, and then we'll go from there. All right, guys, let's do this here. Now, hey guys, Just pay today attention. I'm going to show you a very strange ancient site in India, completely built underground. This site is shrouded in mystery. We don't know who built it, why it was built, and how it was built. Experts believe it is at least 1,200 years old, and some locals even say it is 5,000 years old. The shape of the structure is mind-boggling. When you see it from the air, it has a very unique shape, like an elaborately fashioned keyhole. I first visited this site in the last week of March, and I was amazed by the outer view and immediately proceeded to go down the steps to see what is underground. As I went in about a dozen steps, I realized that the entire structure is filled with water from a certain point onwards. I was not able to see the floor or what's inside because of the water and the water is heavily contaminated. However, I was able to see Hindu religious signs painted inside and I decided to go back up to the ground level and see if I could get another view. On top there is a metal gate which is permanently locked. I looked through it and I could see some amazing carvings in the middle of all the water. The pillars are partially submerged underwater but exquisitely carved. At this point I was dying to go inside but it was impossible to get in. Locked water but exquisitely carved. At this point I was dying. Now, see this pillar right here. That also looks like the people of Middle Earth. Now, humans, let me get that, thank you. Humans, it's just like in The Wizard of Oz. When the tornado come, the humans have to get in, in the ground, right? Uh -huh. We always got to go underground until, until everything is safe for us to be on top of such. Uh -huh. Same story with with Noah and the Ark. ...to go inside, but it was impossible to get in. Luckily, locals told me something very interesting. Every year, locals pump the water out on a certain date and clean up the site for... As you see the markings on the wall here, they look like the same paint that's on the characters in Atlantis. 
let's bring that back so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, well, number one, you can actually see, see the monkey there, 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 and there. Now, these pillars, right, also can go with the Kabbalicism of the three pillars of knowledge, right, because there's always a lot of pillars. Told me something close. very interesting. Every year, locals pump the water see, out on a there. certain date and clean up the site for a religious there. event, and that event will be held today, the 19th of April. So I decided to wait. Then we go back here. And we have the same marking. When Milo and Kita emerge from the pond, oh, other yeah. fun people who support me. While the Discord server that is filled with conversations on Disney love is only $3 a month, any donation helps me feel more secure and ready to continue to share the magic of Disney. So please consider checking out my Patreon page. That is linked below. Now let's begin to dive into the highly requested story of Kida, whose fans are as adamant and resilient as her, since they ensured this video was made. Especially after watching the sequel film Atlantis Milo's Return, I knew this was going to be a topic I had to discuss for all of you fun people. And thanks to the encouragement of so many of you, it's finally happening. Of course, if you have any other ideas that you'd like to see come onto the channel, definitely let me know in the comments section. After a power source descended from the stars, the kingdom of Atlantis grew in strength as they discovered electricity, modern medicine, and even the wonders of light due to the wondrous energy that derived from the cosmic crystal. What the citizens of Atlantis were able to do was establish their civilization with unbelievably advanced technology for the time period, all thanks to that cosmic power source they called the Heart of Atlantis. This massive crystal that floated above the city fed upon the collective emotions of all who came before, and in exchange the consciousness within it provided power, longevity, and protection to its people. Through the connection with the crystals and the leadership of the royal family, Atlantis dominated the world. Due to Atlantis's affluence and strength, around 85 to 8800 years ago, the king of Atlantis, King Kashikanetic, became arrogant with power and escalated their use of the crystal. Instead of using their new technological powers for good, the king began to build a fleet of flying machines called Kedex to rule the sky, and constructed artificially intelligent leviathans to rage war in the sea. Atlanteans used their weapons to expand their borders, colonize the ancient world, and subjugate the people they took over. During this time of prosperity, conquering, and war, the king and queen also had the princess of Atlantis, a daughter named Kidakakash, who you know as Kida. Unfortunately though, while Kida was born into the great empire her family had constructed, she would not be able to live during this time of opulence and might for long. Early into Kida's life, the hubris of her father led to a weapon being created that was so destructive that its accidental discharge created what is known as the Great Flood, that had the potential to eradicate Atlantis completely. But before the entirety of the kingdom was destroyed, the crystal bonded with the royal blood of Kida's mother, calling upon her to save the city. Now, could the Great Flood also be sin significant to the Great Flood that we know as... Noah and his ark. Now, the people of Middle Earth give different stories. Now, you have the kind where they were making a new religion because it's, it's, it's a whole bunch of different types. And then you have the people of Middle Earth that come from the Lord of the Rings. And as I did further research, it seems like the people of Middle Earth match with the ones from Lord of the Rings, not the other ones with the big heads, the aliens, because they're not really aliens, but they were really, really smart. So as humans, we think if you're really, 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 really smart, you got a bigger head, i.e. Jimmy Neutron, but it's not always true. So let's move into the Lord of the Rings version of the Middle Earth people. Come on, y'all. His messengers to watch over the Eldar. These were called the Great Eagles, and they served the Rondor. The great among these spirits, the elves, name the Valar, the powers of Arda. 
and men have often called them gods. The lords of the Valar are seven, and the Valir, the queens of the Valar, are seven also. Well met, friends. Joystin here with another Beings of Middle-Earth video for you all today. This time, we will be discussing the Valar, or gods, of Tolkien's works. As their individual histories are very long and descriptive, I won't go into a great amount of detail about each of them. Rather, I will talk about their great... Now, as you see these people pass on your screen, do you not see anybody that looks like the same or have the same characteristics of the people in Atlantis? Pay attention closely, y'all. ...to deeds during their time. Let's begin. Our first mention is actually no longer accounted as one of the 14 Valar after his betrayals. The group... And the numbers still match with numerology, so if you have 14, that would come to 5, which would be the pentagram. Now, um, we also have a um, sad theory coming very soon, that um, Elvira and um, the, 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 the monsters and, and the mama from the Adams family, they also from Middle Earth. Because if you notice... A lot of the females, like that one right there, see that one right there. See these ones, they look like El Elvira and, and, and different versions of them. Let's watch closely. Or gods of Tolkien's works. As their individual histories are very long and descriptive, I won't go into a great amount of detail about each of them. Rather, I will talk about their greatest deeds during their time. Let's begin. Our first mention is actually no longer accounted as one of the 14 Valar after his betrayals. The greatest of the Ainur, the group who sang the world into existence, and most powerful of the Valar is named Melkor. Now let's go further this Lord of into where it is first before we go back to the people. Well, need such an elaborate design and extraordinary carvings. Why create them at all, as they are going to be underwater most of the year? It has some other purpose. The entire structure was made for some scientific reason, a reason which we are not able to understand. Why did they have to build it in such a unique shape? It is even visible from the satellite, and the shape immediately catches your attention. Is it a coincidence, or was it meant to be recognized from the sky? Why is the structure so mysterious? No one knows its original name, and it has at least half a dozen nicknames among locals. What is interesting is that this square in the center is called Kurunguri, which literally means black hole in Tamil language. What is even more surprising, locals believe that this hole has a secret doorway to a divine world. It could take you to a parallel universe. Did ancient builders create some kind of a doorway to access a path. Now, we believe that a parallel universe is when you walk in and then it it's like the whole thing changes. But remember, you know, like in Wayside School, you don't need to look it up on YouTube if you're not sure. Um, everything is upside down because of the structure, right? Mm -hmm. He was supposed to build one floor with 30 classrooms. He built a 34 feet ship with a classroom on each floor. So then everything is out of whack, right? Right. So then on science day, they throw desk out the window instead of doing science. Uh -huh. You know, things fall from the sky uh -huh. on Wednesday. Uh -huh. And things are different, so wouldn't that be a different parallel universe because you walked inside this school? Uh-huh. It don't have to change everything outside. Right. It's just like if you walk in your room and your room is hooked up the way you want and it's not like outside, that'd be a different universe. Because it encompasses everything you need, kind of like Co-op City. That's right. a different universe or a different, as we would say, city of its own because it is self-sufficient. 
Right. So people in Atlantis would not need to go up, up, up where we are, right? Because mm -hmm. they had everything. They need it. Right. Now, my thing is this, though. Where the gills and all that stuff? That's another That's another video that we're going to add on to that in a second, but keep watching this. Hello, universe. Is this why this structure was built? Sitting in this place, looking at the black hole, I wonder if there could really be a doorway inside this which leads somewhere. Locals vehemently insist that it does have a doorway, and some claim to have even seen it. I've shown you so many different ancient sites. Many of them go underwater, and locals always claim there is a secret entrance inside. Is this site also going to be yet another one where I simply theorize there is a hidden doorway? No, today I'm going to show you that doorway. Look carefully at the inside walls. You don't see anything on this side, but on this wall, you can clearly see the opening. This is the top of the underwater doorway. You can even see the shadow of it being cast on water. But I want to see the entire doorway. So I found an archive footage of the site which was shot many years ago. And you're looking at the archive footage now. And you can see that at that time they had pumped out about six feet of water from the black hole. On three sides, there's nothing. These are just regular stone slabs. Well, but on the good. fourth side, you can clearly see a perfectly rectangular doorway. Finally, all the local stories turn out to be true. This is an entrance to some place. Some of you will try to explain it as a water inlet or outlet, but for that purpose, a small circular hole would have been enough. This is more than five feet tall, and it could even be larger since we're not able to see the bottom. Such a large, perfectly rectangular doorway was not built for anything else other than facilitating someone to use it to go somewhere. But where does it lead? Who would be able to use this underwater passage? Does it really lead to a parallel universe? Is the name black hole a mere coincidence or are we looking at something scientific? Perhaps I could find some clue from these carvings. They're quite amazing. Even after being underwater almost throughout the year, the carvings show very little sign of corrosion. This is Garuda, a popular flying god in Hinduism. This one does not look human. It has a conical face and its legs are pointing in opposite directions. Here's a monkey facing off with a gigantic snake. We can see strange slots carved on them. But the more I walk around and I try to find out what's going on, the more mysterious this structure seems to become. Why is the structure always filled with so much water that it needs to be pumped out on a certain date? Remember, I visited the structure in March when it was full of water. At that time, I also visited the lake nearby, which is less than half a mile away. It was completely dry, and by looking at the lake bed, we can understand that it's been dry for many months. This part of India is a very dry area, and this lake is much deeper than the ancient site. Yet, the lake is bone dry, and the black hole site is always filled with water. How is that possible?
When Milo and Kida emerge from the pond, Milo's commander, Lyle Rourke, attacks the duo Checking out my Patreon page, that is linked below. Now let's begin to dive into the highly requested story of Kida, whose fans are as adamant and resilient as her, since they ensured this video was made. Especially after watching the sequel film Atlantis Milo's Return, I knew this was going to be a topic I had to discuss for all of you fun people, and thanks to the encouragement of so many of you, it's finally happening. Of course, if you have any other ideas that you'd like to see come onto the channel, definitely let me know due to the wondrous energy that derived from the cosmic crystal. What the citizens of Atlantis were able to do was establish their civilization with unbelievably advanced technology for the time period, all thanks to that cosmic power source they called the Heart of Atlantis. This massive crystal that floated above the city fed upon the collective emotions of all who came before, and in exchange the consciousness within it provided power, longevity, and protection to its people. Through the connection with the crystals and the leadership of the royal family, Atlantis dominated the world. Due to Atlantis's affluence and strength, around 85 to 8800 years ago, the king of Atlantis, King Kashikamnetic, became arrogant with power and escalated their use of the crystal. Instead of using their new technological powers for good, the king began to build a fleet of flying machines called Kedex to rule the sky, and constructed artificially intelligent leviathans to wage war in the sea. Atlanteans used their weapons to expand their borders, colonize the ancient world, and subjugate the people they took over. During this time of prosperity, conquering, and war, the king and queen also had the princess of Atlantis, a daughter named Kidakagash, who you know as Kida. Unfortunately though, while Kida was born into the great empire her family had constructed, she would not be able to live during this time of opulence and might for long. Early into Kida's life, the hubris of her father led to a weapon being created that was so destructive that its accidental discharge created what is known as the Great Flood that had the potential to eradicate Atlantis completely. But before the entirety of the kingdom was destroyed, the crystal bonded with the royal blood of Kida's mother, calling upon her to save the city by summoning the crystal guardians to construct a force field around the center of Atlantis. All the young Kitty could do was cry and scream for her mother as she watched her mother sacrifice herself to save the city her father had endangered. The Queen of Atlantis became lost to the crystal after being bound to it for too long, as her connection had to endure as the city was buried beneath the depths of the ocean. Understanding the arrogance that he had once possessed, Kita's father in turn decided that he must remove the temptation of the crystal from his people forever, so no one would repeat what he had done. He never wanted Kita to be forced to suffer the same fate as her mother, as he knew if Atlantis needed a savior again, they would turn to her royal blood. In hopes of further solidifying his people's longevity, he ordered the destruction of his empire's history and hid the heart of Atlantis beneath his throne room, ensuring that the glory of Atlantis would be lost. Now, that correlates with islands like Jamaica, which had flipped over and they lost all most of their history, so they had to be retaught in a different way. So, I think that happened to us, but let's move on and you can understand. Even Kida, the inheritor of Atlantis itself, was forbidden from being educated in any capacity. That world that was led by a fearful ruler and was forced to remain ignorant was the Atlantis that Kida grew up within. Growing up, Kida lived amongst the horrors and ruins of her home, eventually forgetting what Atlantis had once been like when she was a little girl, even forgetting most of what happened when her people's destruction came. As her father's memory held onto the crippling disaster he caused, hers faded. All I can remember is the sky going dark and people shouting and running. But even though Atlantis was broken and she retained little information on life before the Great Flood, Kida remained sure that she had a responsibility to protect the fate of her people and Atlantis. To keep her home safe from all who would attempt to threaten Atlantis, Kida trained to be a strong and skilled warrior who could use her strength to overwhelm hostiles. Over the many years she trained, she became fierce and relentless, unwilling to risk the deceit of any foreigner, leading to her, for thousands of years, becoming capable of killing outsiders on sight. A thousand years ago, you would have slain them on sight. Kita patrolled her borders and was scavenging around her home, just waiting to strike if she was ever called to do so. 
By doing that consistently for long enough, she eventually uncovered some secrets. But that's for later. Even though Kina was not yet on the throne, her people came before everything else. As she watched her future subjects, though, over the thousands of years she fought off threats, Kida became disturbed and deeply saddened by what she witnessed. Kida wanted to keep her citizens safe so they could live long, grand. Now, how could she live over a thousand years <coughs> if she wasn't a Middle Earthian? Lives, but. As time passed, she saw their way of life degrade. They weren't flourishing, they were fading and were slowly suffering. But when she brought up the idea that her people needed help, the king disregarded that point of view. The king valued hiding the truth to their undoing, resistance, and vitality more than the ability for Atlantis to rebuild and thrive again, and this led to conflict between Kida and her father. Although Kida can seem quite forceful, violent, and aggressive at times, she has a kind heart that is unwilling to relent when she can help others. After seeing Atlantis crumble around them after thousands of years, and seeing her culture degrade before her eyes, she feels the burden and depression from watching the slow decay of her home. Kida even goes to the extent of tattooing herself with what her animator Randy Haycock explained are marks under her eyes to represent her many tears for Atlantis. She would never forget how they suffered. The kings of our past would weep if they could see how far we have fallen. Committed to assisting the kingdom regain their past glory and move past their fall from grace, Kida looked to their past. his messengers to watch over the Eldar. These were called the Great Eagles, and they served the Rondor, chief lieutenant of Manwe. Once the War of Wrath was through, Manwe banished his brother Melkor beyond the world, so that some measure of peace may be known to Iluvatar's children. Manwe still rules in Amon. Manwe's wife, Farda, or Elbereth as she was known, was the Queen of the Valar, and Lady of the Stars. She was the most beautiful of the Valar, as Iluvatar's light shined in her face, and she had created the stars and constellations. The elves revered her most out of all of the Valar, as the first sight that they had seen in life after their awakening were her stars. She filled the lamps of the Valar with light, collected the resin of the two trees in her wells, hollowed the Silmarils, gave the sun and the moon their courses, and established Eorendil's star. She was also the first to distrust Melkor, and she was his first enemy, and one of the two Valar he feared most. Ulmo is next. As the lord of the seas, rivers, and all waters in Arda, Ulmo helped fashion the world, but he had no home or wife in Valinor. Rather, he lived in a place called Ulmonon, beneath the sea. Alongside Varda, Melkor feared Ulmo the most, as the sea could not be tamed. Ulmo most directly opposed Melkor out of all of the Valar as well, and interacted most with the Free Peoples. Ulmo is responsible for urging Turgon to build Gondolin, and for sending Tur to Gondolin, and for saving Elwing so that a Silmaril might come to Valinor. Next is Aule the Smith, or Mahal as he would be called by the Dwarves. Aule was the lord of the Earth's natural substances, and in the beginning he fashioned the look of the world. Well, this nigga looks small over here. Why he looks old? I mean, look, he all chiseled and shit. Like he was doing a hundred crunches, just ski, ski. I'm just saying. His greatest creations are the vessels of the sun and moon, the lamps of the Valar, the chain in the Igor that held Melkor, and most of all, he is renowned for the creation of the dwarves. He had grown impatient for the children of Iluvatar, so he created the dwarves. However, Aule the smith thought he committed a crime against Iluvatar, so as he prepared to destroy his creation and the dwarves, Iluvatar stopped him. After the creation of the seven dwarven fathers, Aule had taught them Khazduel and smithwork. Now Iluvatar gave them life, and they were put to sleep in different spots in Middle-earth, until after the awakening of the elves. Aule's wife is Yavanna, the giver of fruits. She was responsible for all growing things in nature, and lived in pastures. She knew that the world would need trees, and the trees would need guardians. 
So Yavanna pleaded with Manwe, and Manwe prayed to Iluvatar, and Iluvatar created the Ents, or Tree Herders. It was her music with Nyanna's tears that created the two trees of Valinor, and if Feanor had given her the light, she could have remade them after their destruction. She also created the tree of Galathilion in Tyrion, whose descendants would be the White Trees of Gondor. The next Vala on our list is Arome, the Huntsman. During the Years of the Trees, and after most other Valar secluded themselves, Arome still hunted in the lands of the world on occasion. He first came across the Elves after they had awoken beneath the stars, and he befriended them, calling them the Eldar. As the most powerful of hunters, Arome openly defied Melkor, alongside his hunting hound Huon, who he would give to Kelegorm, one of Feanor's sons. He also had a great steed named Nahar, and a horn called Valoroma that could be heard over all other horns. The Eldar could hear this horn when he was hunting Melkor's servants. His wife was called Vanna, the Ever Young. She was the younger sister of Yavanna, and had the greatest influence over the flowers in Arda, and her servants, Melion and Ariane, had aided her in tending flowers in her gardens. The next one is a grim Vala. Mandos, or Namo, was the doomsman of the Valar, who resided in his halls where the dead would go. He pronounced the will of Iluvatar when commanded to by Manwe, but he was not malicious like Melkor was. He simply provided the judgments of Iluvatar. Some of his more famous actions were imprisoning Melkor after his first war with the Valar, announcing the doom of the Noldor that banished the elves from Valinor, aiding Baron in coming back to life after being moved to pity by Luthien, and giving half-elves the choice of mortality or immortality after the coming of Eärendil to Aman. Mandos also had a hound named Gorgumoth that guarded his worst prisoner Melkor. His siblings were Ermo and Nyanna. His wife was Vadier. Vadier the Weaver made tapestries of history, and they would cover all of Mandos' halls as time and the ages went forth. After the death of her husband Finwë, Marielle was returned to life to weave the fate of the House of Finwë for Varie. Nyanna, the Lady of Mercy, was responsible for all grief and sadness throughout Arda. Her part in the music of the Ainur was one of great sadness, and so sadness came to be in the world. She mourned for the world, and for the destruction that Melkor wrecked upon it, but it was also her pity that helped free Melkor after three ages in captivity. She dwelt in her halls near the halls of Mandos, and her tears fed the two trees of Valinor. She mourned for their destruction also, and through her tears one last flower from the trees came to be, and so the sun and moon were made from it. She was Olorin's mentor, and wore a grey hood, so it is likely also that Gandalf wore grey in reverence to his teacher. Now we come to Urmo, or Lorien, the master of dreams. He was responsible for dreams, desires, and visions. He and his wife Este dwelt in the gardens of Lorien, in the land of Valinor. It was here where Mariel passed away after giving birth to Feanor, and she was given peace. Later, while Varda wanted the sun and moon to ever be aloft in Ilmen, the atmosphere, the prayers of Ermo and Este allowed for day and night so that sleep may be had by the people of the world. Varda heard these prayers, and she made it so that while the sun or moon was in the sky, the other was in Achaea, or the encircling sea. Este, Ermo's wife, was responsible for healing the wounds of the hurt and weary. She dwelt in Lorien on an island of a tree-shadowed lake, and oftentimes the Valar would find refreshment. They're on track to hit a 1.5% growth increase by the end of the quarter. If we reduce executive salaries by just 5%, we'll get to the European market. There are carvings which are baffling, and they're all carved in the dark corners of the temple. We're back in India. Now we're going to find an uh, ancient temple of time travel, which is a, a, um, okay, let's say we had different rooms. This is a different room of the palace, because some of it's on the ground, and then some of it's above. Let's get that beautiful bean footage. Today, even though the temple has electric lights, the strangest carvings still lurk in deep, dark areas, and these carvings have no explanation until now. Let's take a look at 
this carving. It has a figure which has the head of an elephant standing upright. You may think this is the popular Hindu god Ganesha, but it is not because this is a female figure and Ganesha is a male god. And what's even more interesting is that it has wings like an eagle. You can even see the feathers on the wings. Now look at the legs. These are long, slender, cylindrical feet which defy any explanation. What could this possibly be? Even today, scientists have not been able to create such a species through genetic engineering. Now, the flying things, they also made those in Middle Earth, the little creatures to fly. And then they made the um, aircrafts. Now, this would be the place where you find the early aircrafts, which would be in India, which would also be made by Atlantis, because they had um, technology that was ahead of our time, correct? Correct. Mm hmm For sure. Thank we you. do not Thank have you. enough technology to do no, this no. as of today. But a hundred years from now, we could easily create a species like an elephant with wings. Believe it or not, scientists are said to be secretly working even to create... And geonome, it's funny that it has the word gnome in it. And think about it, if we were stuck in a um, um, smaller circumference, we would grow shorter. Because if your whole universe is a box, you, there's no need for you to grow out of it because you wouldn't be able to, um, um, you wouldn't be able to access everything you need. Now, of course, through DNA and um, evolution, there's going to be taller people. But as a whole, they was going to be really tiny, right? Yes. Elves and gnomes and stuff like sorts. Human beings with wings. It is estimated that this will be achieved in less than 100 years from now. And this is exactly what we see here in this carving. At first look, I thought it was just a regular mother playing with a baby. But upon looking carefully, I realized that she has wings ready to fly. While these carvings seem to show developments in the future, here's a carving which shows something from a distant past. This animal you see here is a type of saber-toothed cat, sometimes even known as a saber-toothed tiger. This particular species is called Thylacosmolus. The Thylacosmolus looks like a modern-day lion or tiger, but the main difference is its exceptionally long upper canine teeth. This carving undoubtedly shows this particular species with protruding fang-like teeth and a long tail. If you compare this carving with the modern-day recreation of this animal using fossil evidence, we can see that they're almost identical. However, here's the problem. All experts agree that this species became extinct 2.5 million years ago. And historians and archeologists tell us that this temple was built about 2,000 years ago in order for sculptors to carve such an animal. They must have seen the Thylacosmolus.